Having moved above the trees into a clear area, Park stopped to look back over the forest, the green lakes, the glacier, the snow fields, and the white peaks beyond. I asked him if from his experience he would call this wilderness. No, he said, not with his trail in it. He agreed that what we were looking at was almost incomparable, and he said he doubted if Brower saw anything he didn't see. That is a beautiful view, he went on, and these are magnificent mountains. They remind me of the Chilean Andes. But how is a mining company operating a pit on the other side of this ridge going to hurt all this? I don't see it. My idea of conservation is maximum use. I think preserving wilderness as wilderness is a terrible mistake. This area is one of the few places in the country where copper exists now in commercial quantities, and we just have to have copper. The way things are set up, we can't do without it. To lock this place up as wilderness could imperil the whole park system, because in 10 years or so, when copper becomes really short, people will start yelling and revisions will have to be made. Any act of Congress can be repealed. Park was speaking slowly, and we were making our way up through alpine meadow that were splayed with streams and full of heather, lupine, horsemen, daisies, and wild licorice. I'm in favor of multiple use of land, he continued. Have you ever been in the Hartz Mountains? With proper housekeeping, you can have a mine and a sawmill and a primitive area all close together. When the Kermagee Corporation wanted to mine phosphate on the coast of Georgia, conservationists howled. A hearing was held, and 26 people, most of them representing groups, testified against Kermagee. No one testified for them. This shocked me. It was like people standing around watching a man get beat up. When Texas Gulf Sulphur drilled three holes and found an ore body in Ontario, people accused them of hiding information. I testified before the SEC on their behalf. The image of copper companies today is bad, with all this conservation poop. There's a Clark's Nutcracker. The Nutcracker in flight was 100 feet above us. We were now about to top the final rise to Cloudy Pass, where Brower was waiting. We looked back again over the eastward view. Lakes, peaks, beaver ponds, cascades, snow, ice, white ribbon streams, and dark green forests. Again, Park said, I don't see it. I don't see how a mine on the other side of this ridge is going to affect that. With his pick, he swung at an outcropping with what seemed to me to be unusual curiosity and force. What are you looking for, I said. A grin, a grin came into the corner of his mouth. Nothing, he said. I haven't hit one in a long time, that's all. <laughs> Brower had dropped his pack and was sitting on a small knoll among the flowers. Park and I and Brigham and Snow dropped our own packs and felt the sudden coolness of air reaching the sweat lines where the packs had been and the inebriate lightness that comes after a long climb when the backpack is suddenly gone. The ground Brower was sitting on was 10 or 15 feet higher than the ground on which we stood, and as we went up to join him, our eyes at last moved above the ridge line, and for the first time we could see beyond it. What we saw made us all stop. One of the medical students said, Wow. I said slowly, the words just involuntarily falling out, My God, look at that. Across a deep gulf of air and nearly a mile higher than the ground on which we stood, 11 miles away by line of sight was Glacier Peak palpable, immediate, immense. In the direction we were looking, we could see perhaps 200 square miles of land, and the big mountain dominated that scene in the way that the Jungfrau dominates the Bernese Alps. Brower said without emphasis, that is what is known in my trade as a scenic climax. In the central foreground of the view that we were looking at from Cloudy Pass was the load of copper that Kennecott would mine and to do so, the company would make an open pit at least 2,000 feet, 2,400 feet from rim to rim. Park said, a hole in the ground will not materially hurt this scenery. Brower stood up. None of the experts on scenic resources will agree with you, he said. This is one of the few remaining great wildernesses in the lower 48. Copper is not the transcendent value here. Without copper, we'd be in a pretty sorry situation. If that deposit didn't exist, we'd get by without it, Brower said. I would prefer the mountain as it is, but the copper is there, Park said. If we're down to where we have to take copper from places this beautiful, we're down pretty far. Minerals are where you find them. The quantities are finite. It's criminal to waste minerals when the standard of living of your people depends on them. A mine cannot move. It is fixed by nature, so it has to take precedence over any other use. If there were a copper deposit in Yellowstone Park, i recommend mining it. Proper use of minerals is essential. You have to get them where they are. Our standard of living is based on this. For 50 years, yes, but for the long term, no, Brower said. We have to drop our standard of living so that people a thousand years from now can have any standard of living at all. A breeze coming off the nearby acres of snow felt cool but not chilling in the sunshine and rumpled the white hair of the two men. 
I am not for penalizing people today for the sake of future generations, Park said. I really am, said Brower. That's where we differ. Yes, that's where we disagree, Park said. Brower swung his pack up onto his back. Pretend the copper deposit down there doesn't exist, he said. Then what do you do? What are you going to do when it's gone? You're trying to make everything wilderness, Park said. No, I'm not. I'm trying to keep at least 2% of the terrain as wilderness, Brower said. 2% is a lot. 2% is under pavement, Brower said. Basically, our difference is that I feel we can't stop all this. We must direct it. You feel we must stop it. I feel we should go back, recycle, do things over again, and do better, even if it costs more. We mine things and don't use them again. We coat the surface of the earth with beer cans and chemicals, asphalt, and old television sets. We are recycling copper, Park said, but we don't have enough. When we knock buildings down, we don't take the copper out, Brower said. Every building that comes down could be a copper mine, but we don't take the copper out. If we go after fresh metal, we destroy that mountain. How can you ruin a mountain like Glacier Peak, Park lifted his pick toward the mountain. You can't ruin it, he went on, waving the pick. Look at the Swiss mountains. Who could ruin them? A mine would not hurt this country, not with proper housekeeping. Brower said, would America have to go without much to leave its finest wilderness unspoiled? We traversed a couple of switchbacks and approached the bottom of the ravine. Then Park said, where they are more easily accessible, deposits have been found and are being or have been mined. We had seen such a mine near Lake Chelan in the eastern part of the mountains. The Howe Sound Mining Company established an underground copper mine there in 1938, built a village and called it Holden. The Holden mine was abandoned in 1957. We had hiked past its remains on our way to the wilderness area. Against a backdrop of snowy peaks, two flat top hills of earth detritus broke the landscape. One was the dump where all the rocks had been put that was removed from the miners re when the miners reached the ore body. The other consisted of tailings, crushed rock that had been through the Holden mill and had yielded copper. What remained of the mill itself was a macabre skeleton of bent, twisted, and rusted beams. Wooden buildings and sheds were rotting and gradually collapsing. The area was bestrewn with huge flakes of corrugated iron, rusted rails, rusted ore carts, old barrels. Although there was no way for an automobile to get to Holden except by barge up Lake Chelan and then on a dirt road to the village, we saw there were a huge pile of gutted and rusted automobiles, which themselves had originally been rock in the earth and in the end in Holden were crumbling slowly back into the ground. Park hit a ledge with the pick. We were coming up the other side of the ravine now. The going was steep and the pace slowed. Brower said, we saw good housekeeping at Holden. It's one god-awful mess, he said. That old mill could be cleaned up, Park said. Grass could be planted on the dumps and the tailings. Suato Pass was now less than a quarter mile ahead of us. When we reached the pass, we stood for a moment and looked again at Glacier Peak, and far below us, the curving white line of the Suato. Park said, when you create a mine, there are two things you can't avoid, a hole in the ground and a dump for waste rock. Those are the two things you can't avoid, Brower said, except by not doing it at all.